This is Old Gam. And this is Not a Spring Chick, and this is our Cans Daily for May 20th. Uh, today was the quote of the day. Uh, I like this one. If I'd known that I would be sentenced to death, I'd have killed more people. It's a character from the film uh, War on No Tape, basically. Well, if you're going to be sentenced, you might as well have fun, right? I know yeah, that sounds well, really no, bad, uh, but if you're going to be sentenced to death anyway. Well, I know, I remember. Oh, um, is, is that kind of a warp sense? No, it was because I've known people that basically said that um, my father knew him. He said, well, I don't know was, that that was going to be my penalty. I just killed more people and not worried about it. So. Well, yeah, because, well, what is, what is it? What if one of them you're a, one of them you're a murderer, and the other one you're a, it's not conqueror. No, but. no. If you're if if you're a professional killer, they don't set they don't they don't give you the death penalty. Mm. So only if you're an amateur do you get the death penalty. So uh, basically, we got actors and directors today at Cannes. We and of course, we're talking about the Cannes Film Festival, the Festival of Cannes, which is May fifteenth through the twenty sixth in the South of France. And we're trying to give you people that we haven't talked about before. That Although are, we, they come and change, so they may have some of the repeats. Well, no, but but we already gave the re oh. those, so I'm trying to give you ones that we haven't New, new people. That's right. Oh, although Jimmy Jean-Louis, he we haven't shown up on any new I list. know. What the problem comes is that we know people that are there that are not showing up on these things. So mm -hmm. uh, we know people that have been, you know, we know producers and directors that are there that are also well-known actors. They're not yeah, showing we're up. Name, names that should be. Um, here we have Jason Abelos, Alec Baldwin, yeah. Nelson Blake, yeah, Jimmy Kahn. Ah. Uh, See, he must have a film there because he usually doesn't show up for the. I mean. And we have uh, Marianne Colliard, which is in a movie with I mm. think Clive Owen. Matt Damon. Yeah, Brian De Palma. Yeah, mm -hmm. We got Bo Derns for a change. Oh, we do. Bruce and Laura. Michael Douglas and Rosario Dawson. Why well, didn't actually I didn't like Matt Damon? You believe yeah. that? And Matt Damon. How did I miss that? I'm so. gonna say Leonardo DiCaprio, even though he's I been know. there anyway since the beginning because of the Great Gatsby Spring. But it's nice to see him there. We have John Goodman who's there with the Cohen brothers. I knew he was there today. He finally got you know, he was at the press conference. So you knew he was there, we just didn't get attention. Yeah, we saw him with Justin Timberlake. We got a good picture of him looking over, over her shoulder. Then we got uh, Rob Lowe. Rob Lowe? What's Rob Lowe? He, he must be in a movie there. Because this is the first time I've ever seen him at Cannes, and he usually, he, he's he been basically on TV for a while. Yeah, but what happens is that people don't understand that Cannes is actually part of the Marsh du Film, or Marsh du Cinema, depending on what you want to call it. And the people that are over here come over here also. Mm -hmm. And they are getting people from over here to come over here to do the carpets because they're really thin this year. Oh, Garrett Hanlon from Tron. Yeah, yeah, I know. Awesome we keep forgetting him. I've seen him trying to figure out what his name was, and I saw Tron again last night. So. Mm -hmm. And they're getting ready to do the next Tron. I mean, we, we have talked to Bruce Boxleiger. He, this is Bruce Boxleiger talking about it. Oh, I do have a picture of him from one of the things. Yeah, I know he was uh, Night of 100 Stars. We were asking him about it, and he also said, well, that's out of my pay grade. He knew when he said that they were doing Tron, the TV series. But sometimes and they can't really talk about it. Yeah. Oh, Clive Owen. Yeah. And, uh, and Keanu Reeves. And Keanu Reeves. Now, it makes me curious because you know both of them are in movies if they're there. Yeah, and Zoe Sandano, which Zoe? we know why she's there. Why is Zoe there? Uh, because of Star Trek. Are they announcing Star Trek over there? Well, no, it just opened. It's opening oh. there this week. Okay. So that's why I'm thinking they probably want. I've got. Oh, like, and James Franco because James Franco has a movie there. Yeah, I said. Yeah, I've got Old Sultan, Old Sultan Regard Rendezvous. The, the man of many talents. I mean, we've actually. He was actually good in Oz. I actually liked him for the first time in Oz. <laughs> he was. He was he, good in that. Yeah, he didn't play like an insufferable it jerk. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, you know what? He played a different type of character than he usually plays. You're no, right. We, we, no, but we went to one of the great, great Hollywood parties produced by Mr. Franco. That he didn't even bother to come to. So. <laughs> that was that right after he hosted the Oscars. Yeah, he left town. But um, uh, basically, as they first as, as they dying, dying is the first major film and first selection of Cannes by actor, producer, and scriptwriter Jim Franco, who first made a name for himself in the role of Harry Osborn in Spider Man's Nemesis. No, he didn't. He's been, he was a name before that. He got it because he he was a name before that. No, but that's when a lot of people started recognizing him after most that. People don't re most people don't think of James Franco as even being in that movie because that's not the James Franco that most people know. Mm -hmm. 
And now this is where James talks about how his film came about. He says, my father recommended As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner. When I was 15, I read it and it was seduced by its mystery. It was a code I needed to unlock when I was older. I think somebody else wrote this part. <laughs> it's like, I know James. I know. It's not James Franco. <laughs> I'm like... It's, it's not, not gonna... Franco, folks. That's not how he speaks. <laughs> we need to know Franco. <laughs> when I was older... I dreamed about making it into a film. I always thought it would make a great complex film because on one level it is very psychologically and structurally complex, but on another level it is a very simple story. A family is trying to take their dead mother into town to bury her. It's Faulkner. That's, that's all you have to explain. It is Faulkner. I don't know how the heck he managed to get, get hold of the book because those things are generally owned by most of the studios in Hollywood. It's got to be something that the studio did not want, period. Oh, put my glasses on again. Mm. I actually don't need them here, but... And any special memory or anecdote from the shooting? It was the first time I directed with so many mules and horses. Because <laughs> James has actually been very, very busy these last couple of years. Because remember, I mean, a he... lot of Faulkner stuff took place during the, uh, the, the, the Depression and during the Great Dust Bowl in the Middle West. Oh. So it's basically, and that's the time period of this book, like Tobacco Road and, oh. and you know... The, you know, the mice and men, a lot of great things, but... Oh, there are so many scenes on the mule-drawn wagon. A scene that would be so simple if the characters were just sitting in a room. It gets infinitely more complex when it's on an animal-drawn wagon. You have to be aware of the animal's fatigue. You have to put the cameras on the wagon, and when you want to do another take, you have to turn the whole thing around and go back to the start. I almost had a breakdown until I watched a rough assembly and realized that it was working. <laughs> Remember in The Great and Powerful Oz, everything was CGI created. They weren't real. Oh, that's true. So after he had done this, right, going to something like this where you're working, you're working with, with real ones. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just, okay, go back to the green screen and do, you know, it, it works a little bit different with animals. Because, no, I can guarantee you that everybody in Hollywood to tell you the two worst things to work with are kid and animals. And I tend to be a kid working with animals a lot in my job. What type of cinema has influenced you? I love the Darting Brothers, Claire, Claire Dennis's Beau Treville, Sophia Coppola's Mar Marie Antoinette, and they have all influenced this film. I'm curious how Marie, Sophia Coppola's Marie Antoinette influenced a Faulkner. Uh, because it was, a, I think, probably a deteriorating family. Mm. And that was about um, everything that he did. No, I mean, it's not about set design. No, it was about the deterioration of the American family. Uh, what's your next project? Um, we've adapted Cormac McCarthy's third book, Child of God. We will also shoot an adaptation of Andre Dewis's third book, The Garden of Last Days. It would be interesting to see if he ever makes these films because what he tends to do is he's a very experimental artist. He, he and is. And he, he does the little films, not the big films. It looks like, uh, okay, he's counting, I'm, I'm assuming he's counting heavily on the sequel to Oz the Great and Powerful because it gives him the leeway then to make the films that he wants to make. Which has been a big thing with Johnny Depp. Because Johnny Depp has always wanted to do things that are a little offbeat and kind of quirky. But when you have money, you can afford to do it. That's what Johnny Depp That's said. That's what he'll say. He'll do the character until he dies because it gives him the opportunity to do the movies that don't make any money whatsoever. But the funny part is, is Johnny Depp's offbeat movies that are, 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 are clicking are, are like he's got really well. Like Sweeney Todd. <laughs> Whoever thought Sweeney Todd would have made that much money? Yeah, right? they would have got him another Oscar nomination. <laughs> or do that. And it was a good, good film because it was a good Broadway thing built on a really weird premise. But this yeah. is the one you wanted. This, this was the one I wanted. We got the invitation for this one to go and, and cover this one. This was from Bombay Talkies. And it's also the 100 year anniversary of Bollywood. Yeah. So this one is actually a really big deal. And this week the Festival of the Cons invites India and its 100 year old film industry. For this anniversary, Bombay Talkies is presented in a special screen as part of an evening tribute. This film of vignettes brings together four directors of the young generation, four shorts, for an ode to Indian film. Assuming that Indian film can be summed up with Bali would be a mistake, as Khans has demonstrated, or Khans has demonstrated in recent years with films like Udan and Miss Lovely. In India, like everywhere else, film has its codes, its traditions, and it evolves according to technical developments and the context. All the different kinds of film in India are found in Bombay talkies. Oh, yeah. I mean, we have seen um, some 
3D movies that are basically uh, all Indian productions, folks. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I think a lot of um, the Mission Impossible 3 was Indian. Um, a lot of, um, uh, just a oh, lot yeah. of modern Who movies are that? Indian. Nicolas Cage, wasn't his done over? Yeah, Nicolas Cage, the, uh, the his, his Ghost Rider was an Indian production because um, it's a problem. Nick, they said, well, it didn't make as much money as the first, but it only cost one third as much money as the first. Yeah, so it, so it doesn't make money. It made a lot. So, uh, basically, you can find colors and the theatrical style so in, 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 of Kabali with a backdrop, Zoom, Zoom, Darling, a short film by director, Zola Akar, Little Vicky, fascinated by an actress and at home, he practices her dance scenes. Uh, for that, he dresses up, making his father very angry. Okay, uh, I hate to tell people this. Unless you have actually been to India, you don't seem to understand that males dress like, that males can dress like females and be very masculine doing it, folks. They wear skirts and stuff over there. So there's nothing, only in the United States would they find that strange. You've never been to Scotland where they wear kilts. So. And this short film by, by Debaka Banerjee is inspired by stories from the film Giant. Uh, Clary Jit Ray, star, tells the story of Kuander, a failed actor who has just lost his father and wants to impress his daughter. Debaka Banerjee's films, recognizing crowns awards in Asia, deal with social issues that affect the lives of people in India today. Yeah. Karan Johar, also recognized by his peers as plunging into a love story, traditional theme in India, but the lore story tells in Ajib Dharan Haya is anything for traditional. When Gaigar invites Anguish, a gay journalist whom she works with to celebrate her birthday, uh, uh, Avnash reveals to Gaigar that her husband is gay. <laughs> yeah, that they say it is. Really, that's sort of a no-no in, in India, folks. Yeah. Well, Anurag uh, Kashyap is presenting Ugly at the Director's Fortnight. He is also the director of the last section of Bombay Talkies with Muraba story about VJ. His father is going to die soon and to fulfill his last wishes, his son sets out in search of Amitabh Bhakkan. Yeah. Then we're going to um, we're end the day with something very special, totally special, but from the Cinema de la Plague. It's a slice of burlesque at the beach because this is a, a remastering of, uh, of one of the great films in the history of filmmaking in 4K. Oh, it is? Yep. Oh, now that's really cool. Yeah, basically Cinema de la Plague presents an opportunity to rediscover a restored vision of a masterpiece of silent and burlesque, The General by Buster Keaton. The film was based on a true story that took place during the American Civil War. Basically, this movie here sets standards for the history that's, that's of actually, filmmaking. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because I think this is the first one that's been restored to In 4K. In 4K, isn't? I've never, this, it, this is a, it was a ground making, it was funny, a ground making feature film, this was a full length feature film, is a, now a ground making restoration because you imagine that the, the delicateness they had to do to restore a print that's oh basically uh, older than I am, like well, 90 years old maybe. There's many different levels where you have a deep appreciation because I remember when We've been at what NAB where they talk about restoring some of these movies to HD, yeah. where things, especially like special effects, where things that were not visible before no. suddenly become visible, even in HD. But this is in 4K, okay. which we got, talk about the challenges. No, we were there. We had the pleasure, of just, you know, standing in a conversation between George Lucas and um, Ray Harryhausen. Ray, George mm -hmm. Lucas was talking about he loved being a first adopter. He loved all the new toys. He said he hated Blu-ray with a passion because I could see all of the strings and everything that, that mm -hmm. King Kong was being mm -hmm. moved with. I could see the strings that were used on, on uh, movies. They love serials, which is obviously like the, uh, Flash Gordon with the little rocket being held by strings coming down. He said, so it's in almost always, if you're going to do an old film that is that way, you have to then optically go in and spend the time and effort to change or to remove all of the it, pieces that are showing that you don't want to be seen. And this is much has much more definition. Yeah, and this is a more this difficult HD. film. And because, and because the film was older. It's older the movie, very the, delicate. The films that they were talking about before when at the time they were doing it were probably what, like fifty years old? Yeah. Yeah. This This is film I think in nineteen twenty seven. Yeah, so we're we're looking at what, ninety years later? Yeah. Yeah, something 
well, not even, 85 years later. I mean, still, it's, it's, they're older films with higher definition. That's yeah. Of course, so that's a lot of respect. Because, I mean, <laughs> this is a film that all filmmakers have trotted out continually. I mean, I it, like it, it. well, I know, you, you don't actually. She, she grew up in a convent, as I try to tell people, so. But um, Johnny Gray is an ordinary mechanic who spends his days between his job as a railroad engineer and his sweet Annabelle Ali. When the Civil War breaks out, she is captured along with his locomotive, the general by Yankee spies. To prove to her that he is brave, he decides to save her. Well, actually, no. He wanted to save his engine. Oh. It's the engine. Somebody, this is... Well, maybe the, her is his, his train to her. Who, no. Who, <laughs> who, who wrote this? Has never seen the movie. And they will, if you're going to see it, it's the ship, ship is over. Yeah. They think it's about saving the female. No, That's it's about his it. engine. This guy, uh, he does everything on earth you can to save his engine. Her is secondary. It's my engine. They stole my engine. Mm -hmm. So. And the plot of the general is based on an actual incident. Yankee spies managed to take a railway convoy, and the Confederate army captured them in April 1862. Preceded by its calamitous reputation as a financial disaster, the film was a fiasco from its release in 1927. In 1956, there was a remake called The Great Locomotive Chase. Which I was in, folks. You were in that one? Produced yeah. by Walt Disney. 86 years after the original film was made, it is considered one of the greatest family films. Yeah, and it was one of the really good Disney movies of that period because they based it, as I understand, they basically, they looked at the, his movie, they took from his movie and incorporated it into the film. They also did uh, a thing um, they uh, did a movie in the 1940s with uh, Red Skelton, and Red Skelton had Buster Keaton help to help design some of the sequences that were from that movie and put it into the talking movie with Red Skelton also. I know, that, but they like this, uh, oops, it simply, what happened went down a little too far, I know. Yeah. Here we go. In his feature film with a burlesque tone, Buster Keaton did the stunts himself. He always did the stunts himself. Sometimes to the point of risking his life, which he always did, folks. Mm. A person has never seen Buster Keaton. Mm. When this was written, the person knows nothing about Buster Keaton. Buster Keaton basically, uh, he set the tone for action movies. He set the tone for comedies. Jackie Chan is basically a 20th century version, you know, a late 20th century version of Buster Keaton with the way he does comedy, all physical. Um, and you see, to stay as close as possible to the period in the historic veracity, the director who spent one third of the film's budget of recruiting extras. This is a great big god awful big action movie. I oh. mean, we're talking at lots of extras. Wow. Uh, constructed each shot using as a source actual photographs taken during the conflict, recorded by modern video film, the general is presented in a 4K digital version. That. Is intriguing. That I want to see. I know we're gonna have to. They're gonna be releasing it again. Uh, it's one of these things that if you're a collector, you have the general already. But you probably you, you want the 4K version. The 4K Even version. Even if you do not have a 4K computer or or a computer or anything, uh, anything capable of showing it. Yeah, you not still want it. a 4K because this will be something that comes out as a special edition. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be because it will be probably released. Worldwide first, and then on DV on uh, DVDs after. Not, you know, they don't do DVDs anymore. It's probably your downloads, but um, no. But th this is one you'd want on a DVD. So I so guess. Please, yeah. yeah. So just go look at it because I think you'll be surprised and how really great silent movies could be done if they were done by a genius. That basically, uh, Buster Keaton would have been among the greatest of the action directors if he hadn't have been a comic. He would have been. Okay, if he'd have been young when when the talkies came in, and and had Jackie Chan's looks, he would have been the Jackie Chan of the of the 30s, 50s, and 60s, folks. Mm -hmm. Instead, he had this he had this little persona, which he was he actually would uh, when he started out, he was god awful good looking. Mm -hmm. But what happened was he also he also drank and ate a lot. So, but uh, so I guess that ends our coverage for today. And tomorrow we're going to give you more stuff. So until. Tomorrow, this is old Cam. This is not a spring chicken. We're here yesterday, today, and tomorrow for more information. You can go to www.mbnnewsvideoweb.com or www.thetravelsuite.com for information. And there's a little bit of difference between the information between both sites. And we still do have other information up besides just the Cannes Film Festival. Yeah. So wherever you're watching, subscribe to us. Follow our daily newscast and freebie 
um, come, yes, like us and friend us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and that would be at Monty Bubbles or the Travel Suite. But most of all, just go to the websites again, which are? www.moneybubbles.net or www.travelsuite.com. Or mbnewsvideo.com. Yep. Thanks for joining us. Happy camp. <laughs>